Yo, bueno, ahora me voy de aquí. <risa> Iván se carga de las preguntas que no le he dicho, perdón. So, I think we are live now. Welcome to the next activity, which is the round table with three young bioinformaticians. And uh, I am Marisol Benitez. I am a second year PhD student in bioinformatics at the University of Granada. And I am also a member of the Granada Node, uh, the RSD Spain uh, Granada Node called Bioinfo GRX. And I am pleased to present this activity in which uh, three young researchers in the field of bioinformatics will tell us about their work and the vision of this uh, research area. And the format of this activity will be as follows. Uh, first, we will have um, an introduction, a brief introduction of our three guests. Uh, then we will, I will ask them some questions about their research career and their future perspectives. Uh, after that, we will have some more personal questions. And finally, uh, we will have some time for them to answer your questions that I encourage you to present uh, in the chat. So uh, I will present our guests now. We have uh, a bioinformatician starting her PhD, another one just about to present their, te their thesis and uh, an already PhD. So the first one is uh, Eva Tosco Herrera. Uh, Eva is a biologist from the University of La Laguna and she did her degree final project at the statistics department about bioinformatics tools to manage nanopore sequencing data, adding new assets to a previously developed tool on Jupyter Notebooks called NanoDJ. She then obtained a master in biomedicine from the same university, focusing on software assessment for prioritization of germline causal variants of disease uh, for her final master's project uh, in Carlos Flores Laboratory. She is currently working on her PhD, interested in analyzing acute distress respiratory syndrome causes uh, using whole exome sequencing data. Then we have uh, Alba Alvarez Franco. Alba obtained her degree in biology from the University of Salamanca. Uh, there she was trained as a bioinformatician dealing with data analysis uh, related to replication and chromatin structure in Francisco Antequera's lab at the Institute of Functional Biology and Genomics. And then she got involved in Maria Gomez lab um, to do a master in biomedicine, contributing especially with the replication and chromatin landscape of Leishmania major parasite. She then did a master in bioinformatics and computational biology. And currently she is finishing her PhD at Miguel Manzanares lab at the Spanish National Center for Cardiovascular Research while studying computer science and engineering. <laughs> in the lab, she is interested in uh, the progressive nature of ITR fibrillation, mainly through the characterization of the molecular players responsible for the maintenance of this disease. And lastly, we have Miguel Julia. Miguel is a mathematician and PhD in computational biology. He's currently working as a postdoc for the biomonitoring unit at the National, Cancer, the National Center of Environmental Health of the Institute of Health, Carlos III. He always liked medicine, coding, and computers. So when he discovered that he could mix them all into bioinformatics, the choice was a no-brainer. And as we already know, he's the Madrid node leader in RSD Spain. So, Welcome to our three guests. Now we will proceed with the round table, which uh, I will be moderating to keep an appropriate pace. But I would like to remind our guests to be mindful about the time and let the other guests uh, participate as well. So um, welcome to our guests. Welcome, Eva, Alba, and Miguel. Thank you. Yeah. We will start with the first uh, section of questions that is called the history of bioinformatics. So the first question uh, is, what was your first idea of bioinformatics? And we will start with uh, Eva. What thank was your you. first idea? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, thank you for, for the organizing committee, um, which I'm also part of, but I'm glad to be here to um, talk to new people and to tell them about bioinformatics. Um, 
What was my first idea? Well, um, the first thing that comes to mind when you ask me such a great question is that um, I first thought that bioinformatics was something unreachable for me. I felt like I wasn't uh, enough or that I wasn't clever enough or I wasn't intelligent enough to um, to understand bioinformatics. It sounded something like uh, too big uh, in the beginning. But honestly, I found so many people, like uh, so many mentors, people uh, um, that were desiring to give advice to tell me, well, you know, this is something that it's progressive. It's not something immediate. So you get to learn uh, each day. You get to, um, you know, um, to develop um, skills to solve problems. Uh, struggling makes you even more resilient with time. Uh, it's hard, it's difficult, but in the end, if it's your passion and it's what you want to do, uh, it's something that you like doing, uh, in the end, it's worth it. And I, I, I have to admit in my case, it, it, it was right. It's what I wanted to do. Not from the beginning, I was uh, very, I had many doubts. But in the end, um, I'm sure that I'm not the best in my field, but I'm sure that I like what I'm doing and I'm sure that uh, I will try my best to, to solve any problems that might come up in the future. Well, that's a very powerful <laughs> message, Eva. Thank you for your contribution. And Alva, what was your first idea of bioinformatics? So, uh, first of all, thank you also for letting me uh, be here in this round table. Uh, and congratulations for the for the symposium in general. And uh, I agree quite a lot with with uh, what Eva said before. Uh, for me, in my personal situation, the first time I realized that this field exists, uh, I was doing my undergraduate project, and I had uh, two lab mates that were uh, informatics in the lab. Uh, so for me, they were like. Mm, another profile, uh, very different than my own profile. So I felt that imposter syndrome at that time. But as Eva said also, uh, I found that that was mm, the part that I liked the most in the lab. So I decided to to progress in that in in that skills. And yeah, at the beginning it was magic. Now is a bit of magic also, but <laughs> uh, we are doing our best. Okay, and what about you, Miguel? Hi. Thanks for the invitation too. It's been, it's been a really nice symposium today. Um, well, my first uh, idea about informatics was when I was studying my undergrad uh, in mathematics. And I was focusing on mathematical models, uh, projections, predictions, and mathematical models. And everything was uh, orientated to either uh, banking or uh, environmental phenomena, like uh, wildfires, tornadoes, whatever. And I thought, wait, well, maybe we could use this, or maybe if someone is doing this, apply to medicine, uh, human health, or even genomics. And started looking into it, discovered that it was a, actually a, a, a field in science. Uh, I just died in the case I might. I had to study a lot of biology of my own, but uh, I was decided to do it, and at the end I, I did a master's, got into a PhD, and now I'm working on, on that. Okay, so another interesting uh, reflection. And the next uh, question that I have for you is, uh, do you think that bioinformatics is something modern or it has some history already? Um, Eva, what do you think? Um, I think it's um, developing faster uh, nowadays. I think it, it was, it's not so new. It has been around for a couple of years now. But I think uh, nowadays it's uh, it's a different path. It's uh, uh, um, more 
you know, it's accelerating a lot the um, the rhythm of uh, you know de developing new software, new approaches to um, scientific data. In my case, at least uh, biological data. I think um, you know you have to um, keep it up with new articles, uh, new you know developments, uh, everything that comes new each day. It's a new surprise in this field so i think it's it's more tough now than than before to um you know to be aware of all the options that it, they're out there but you know it it's possible <laughs> you have to uh, remain calm you need to um, take some time to you know read the articles to understand what they're saying to apply maybe uh, a software that you like but yeah, I think it's it's you know it's very useful uh, even more nowadays that it's um, everything developing uh, in way faster than before. And Alva and Miguel, do you agree with what uh, Eva just said? Uh, uh, yeah, it, I think is uh, I think something. I think if bioinformatician is not exactly a it's a new idea, but just uh, because it evolves with the accessibility to computers, so and to computer resource and um, powerful machines and that kind of of stuff. So at the end, yeah, it's something new because we are living in this era, no? I totally agree with the, both of them, but uh, I think that uh, access to computers and computers forward was just a, a technical limitation. What has saved the new era of informatics, the new world we're experiencing, is that uh, it's the omics revolution. Now we can see concentrate. And we, we, only, we not only have genomics, uh, we also have expression data. We are uh, starting to see into the exposome data too. So all this data available, it's impossible to be analyzed by human minds. We need computers, we need informatics to extract information from the data. And even you look into the papers nowadays, the, the last papers in public are usually most exploratory with some data, what is data and exploring that the old kind of science that I ask a question and I, I have an hypothesis and I try to produce some experiments. Yes, that's true. Nowadays, there are a lot of uh, data-driven research instead of uh, question-driven research. So, uh, the next question is: If you if you have a reference, a bioinformatician, a senior bioinformatician to look up to uh, when you decided to enter to this field, and anyone can start. Did you have any reference? Uh, I, I have to say that for me, uh, during my development as a informatician, the most important thing that I find was having a, a proper mentor in these in this issues that you have every day with the computer. No? So my first experience, as I said before, was in a lab with two informaticians and they were, they were a bit away of the field that is uh, by informatician itself, because they were not biologists and they don't have. Um, it was not that easy to connect with the same questions that we have, but um, then I find other um, other models in other labs uh, when I when I uh, were uh, that were more more close to my profile, and um, for me it was the the thing that makes me improve the, the work. Okay, so Miguel or Eva, did you have any uh, reference by informatician? Not at the beginning, at least. Because, uh, as I said before, uh, I discovered it by chance when I was an undergrad. Um, my references were my colleagues. When I started working in informatics, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have a network of informaticians to support me. So everyone that I was working with, that I met at symposium, they would be my reference because they knew a little bit more than me. But uh, I, I didn't see like a, a star at the end of the, 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 the track. 
showing me the path. But like just scrolling a little bit every day and talking to people to see how they were doing and what can be done. Well, in my case, um, it was my supervisor when I did my um, final project at the end of the, my uh, biology degree. And it was him that taught me about, uh, you know, bioinformatics, but he was in the statistics department. So it was kind of interesting to hear about, uh, you know, bioinformatics from a statistician or someone that works with statistics. But yeah, it was um, very useful because uh, in the long run, I mean, it was a, finally what I dedicated my life to, what I'm currently working on. And it was such a reference. And luckily, I get to have a great supervisor uh, during my thesis, my PhD. And he's also someone who I can really, um, you know, look up to because he really tries to help uh, as much as he can even though he has not much time or not much free time to dedicate uh, you know to us the, the newbies and, and the phd but yeah he he tries to you know to teach us uh, as as much as he can and that is you know i'm very grateful for that and i get that not anyone i mean not everyone has that opportunity so yeah that it's that it's great to have to have someone you can ask to uh, whenever you you need you need help Yes, I am glad that that is your situation, that you have a good mentor from the beginning of your PhD, as we already saw that a PhD, is a, it can be a quite difficult path. So that yeah. I encourage all the uh, bachelor's degree and master's students here to look uh, for a good mentor. Yeah, to do their research. <laughs> it's yes. interesting. Yes. Yeah, that's really, really important. That's very important. Success in the yeah. So the next uh, topic of questions is about how did you get started in bioinformatics? We have already covered some of the questions like what motivated you to enter the field or uh, what uh, did attracted you. But um, we will move forward with uh, another questions that I have around here is uh, one of them is, what resources did you use to learn bioinformatics? Anyone can start. Um, I can start. My my answer will be short. Um, Google, <laughs> like we said before. Um, Google. <laughs> yeah, like Google is our best friend in, in the meanest of times. So yeah, that's basically it. Um, I love um, getting and attending, uh, you know, online courses. Of course, I don't have much free time to dedicate to other courses, uh, although I would love to because I love learning new things and, you know, um, finding new problems and trying to find new solutions. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, time is limited. We have a lot to do in a very short period of time. So yeah, basically Google Stack, stack Overflow and I think what a bioinformatician, um, bioinformatician must have is, you know, the ability to um, look out for, um, you know, answers online, you know, you have to be a resultive, you have to uh, find a uh, ways to approach, uh, you know, uh, new problems and so on. So you have to be independent in a way, uh, even though it's obviously a great thing that you have someone to, to um, help you with something, uh, colleagues, uh, supervisor, hopefully, but you know, you have, you have to get your abilities to, um, to solve your problems on your own most of the time because uh, sometimes the only person that knows exactly how is uh, your problem is you. So you know the details, you know how this thing is not working or is kind of working. So yeah, that, that's basically it for me. Mm, I totally agree with the Google thing is my best friend also doing my, my thesis. I think uh, it's gonna be my acknowledgement, so for sure. <laughs> Uh, and although, as we say before, it's very important to have uh, your lab mates uh, there. Um, if you can talk uh, with them about bioinformatics and I, and those are related with the field that you are studying, uh, once uh, uh, 
you have more specific problems, as you say, you need more independence and yeah, for sure, you need uh, to look for your own issues. Definitely, you have to learn how to learn. I, uh, I actually started with books. I, I mean, that that sounds cool, and that's all. But uh, coming from a um, technological side of the uh, informatics field, I have to learn a lot of informatics and medicine. So I actually started borrowing books and notes from my friends studying medicine, um, by, uh, by the things. And from there, I just moved to online courses and go back. Actually, I, I, would, I would like to add some uh, online platforms. I don't remember their names uh, right now, but I, maybe I can write any. If someone is interested in some platforms for collaborative problem solving in the field of informatics, that are really useful when you are learning to challenge yourself and to get, to get a taste of it. I haven't heard about that uh, collaborative problem solving platforms. That's uh, very interesting. I think that the key message that we extract uh, from here is the, to learn, adapt, and overcome. <laughs> That's what we have to do on a daily basis as informaticians. So our next question is, uh, did you have uh, any students group to get support? Not necessarily in your lab or in your research group, but groups as uh, RSG notes. Maybe I can start. Uh, Alba, I think Alba wanted to start. You can start. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you, you, well, can also, you can also do this like a collaborative thing. You can have a debate between all of you. So. Okay, well, I, I'm just going to say that um, Tamara presented the, um, the, you know, the story of the RSG uh, Canary Notes, uh, Canary Island Note. Um, so it was basically them. Uh, Tamara was, a, I mean, is still is a, one of my colleagues at the research group, and she taught me, um, you know, this amazing platform and networking, you know, um, possibilities. And I'm very grateful for that because um, even though I have, um, you know, uh, my own colleagues from the research group uh, as itself. I get to uh, to you know more uh, to get to know more people just like Miguel, just like Marcel, uh, Alba, and many others that are very helpful and very you know available to ask for anything basically. So that I'm also very grateful for that because the bigger the community is, uh, the bigger is the ability to um you know to solve problems to help each other out that, that's amazing i think it's almost like a fraternal thing so that's awesome it's like a family like a work family <laughs> so yeah Abba, you can you can continue if you want uh, in my particular case uh, in the lab in which i am right now i'm the only bioinformatician so the situation is um, a bit complex, but in CNIC, uh, we have the lack of having the bioinformatics unit. So, for example, I spent uh, two of the years of my thesis uh, physically there in the in the place. So, it was a, a, a big help in, in my situation. Yeah. Yeah, when I was doing my PhD, I was going to be in a bioinformatics unit, a newly created bioinformatics unit. But in reality, that was a group of dead bioinformaticians from different groups that, as we couldn't see it in the benches, we were in the same place. Uh, yeah, the, the support of the colleagues was really important to overcome the field because we had, uh, all of us had a bad experience of so directors or mentors who were bioinformaticians and they couldn't mentor us in the proper way. So yeah, having a network, I just want to having a network of contacts and informatics especially for this, it's, it's key to survive the PC. So again, we encourage you to join an existing RSG uh, group or form your own if there is uh, not a node in your city, because I think that we all have very good experiences about these networking activities. 
And well, the next question I think is the most interesting one. It's what things would you not do or do if you could travel back in time and start from scratch your bioinformatics journey? I need to think about that, honestly, <laughs> because you can think about um, it. Would you do your PhD here or abroad, or would you have uh, have would you have uh, studied uh, a master's in bioinformatics if you haven't? Um, maybe in my case, I wouldn't change a thing, but mainly because I was like so life driven, you know, L life gave me the opportunity and I just got it. So I, I, I was lucky enough, you know, to, to get here. So honestly, I don't know what I wouldn't do because everything has, you know, bring me here. Everything has, you know, has been great all along. I was lucky enough to have that. So I don't know, guys, what do you think? Well, I, I wouldn't change anything either, despite I'm way wiser right now, but I'm wiser because I, I made those mistakes. I went full into those mistakes. So what I would say that it's really important is to uh, avoid frustration and learn how to how to deal with these situations because these situations happen and it doesn't matter how much you prepare for them you will have a bad time with your PhD if it happens but there is always sun you can the clouds and you can do it yeah again I totally agree with you both <laughs> I wouldn't change anything because I don't know what to change to to change the final situation. So I learn also uh, from my mistakes. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I try to learn uh, all the time from all the possible sources uh, around me, uh, doing the master, um, now trying to study informatics. But at the end, uh, OK, you have your your basic knowledge but at the end the problems that you study in bioinformatics if i in in your lab are so particular <laughs> that it's complex to know what exactly study to achieve that so yeah yes i agree with the key point that you didn't change anything because you like your actual outcome of your phd so uh, I'm, I'm glad that you had that uh, good experience. And yes, I think that learning by mistakes is the best way of learning. It's the uh, harder, <laughs> the hardest part. It's, but you uh, don't forget the lessons. What? You don't forget the, the lessons. Yes, yes, you don't forget that lesson. <laughs> yes. Okay, so. I don't know if you have had any experience with uh, industrial PhDs, but uh, do you would you recommend uh, an academic PhD versus uh, in, an industrial PhD? Or what are your opinion about industrial uh, PhDs? Oh, you go. You go ahead, Miguel. Go ahead. You know, I know about the academic PhD. What the only thing I know about industrial PhDs in Spain is that some of them are not real contracts, they are still in their own uh, legal framework and they are only US courses. So be careful when you are signing for a mutual PhD in Spain because maybe you are not being hired, you are just a student. It, it, it applies to your uh, work plan and years of uh, work experience you have to have for retirement. That's it. That's everything I can contribute here. Yeah, um, you know, I, I I can say that um, for uh, whoever is looking for, uh, you know, for possibilities in the future to do an industrial PhD or something like that, just do your research, honestly. Um, but um, what I mean by that is um, to look for uh, information about that possible group, uh, you know, that research group, the, um, the ID, the... Um, the, sorry, the PI, the principal investigator of the group, uh, you know, because the more you know, the more you'll be able to, um, you know, the choose uh, the right option or the best option that is uh, that life is offering you. 
So yeah, do your research because that is very important. And do not only trust uh, the opinion of a PI, of a principal investigator. Also, um, you know, ask um, colleagues about that, uh, ask people about that, uh, look for uh, more than one perspective because that is important to, um, to choose correctly uh, in the future. That is very important. Yes, totally. I, I agree with you. And also, if I can add something else, mm -hmm. uh, that applies for every, every kind of PSD. When you are researching who is your mentor, who is going to be your group and your mentor, it's really important to ask previous students of that uh, professor. Because for me, at least, in the group where I am, nobody would recommend doing a PSD right now. Okay, so the next section of questions is about what are you doing right now? Uh, so I have already introduced you and I have uh, as I said that at, with, at which uh, point of your career are you? Uh, but I would like to ask you if your area of expertise has changed in your, uh, in your career. So Miguel, you have the longest. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I was reading the chat. Uh, the last ah, question. sorry. So the question was if your uh, area of expertise has changed during your career. Yes, several times. <laughs> I started modeling things and creating methods. In my, in my master's, I uh, just developed software and did an alphabetics. So my profits are in But uh, from there, I moved to human genomics. Uh, both in cancer, rare cancer, then the coronavirus happened, so I moved to Ebola, then I went back to coronavirus diseases, and now I'm working with uh, human biomonitoring, bio sorry, uh, compounds in the population and looking into diseases and health diseases. So, yeah, you can mm -hmm. swap these a lot. Yes. Learn, adapt, overcome. Oh. <laughs> <Really>. <laughs> and what about you, Alba? Uh, in my case, it totally moves uh, all the time. Uh, at the beginning, I was working uh, regarding the scientific topic. I was working with chromatin and replication in GIST. Then I moved to chromatin and transcriptomics in, in Leismania, which is a parasite. And now I'm working with uh, a cardiac disease, um, mainly with transcriptomic and proteomic. Uh, something that is common in all these things is that uh, I was working always analyzing omic data, but now I'm um, trying to uh, be more biostatistics that I was at the beginning. So this is a big change also for me. Uh, and uh, also regarding my profile in the lab, at the beginning I was doing wet lab also with the computer. Uh, I, a part of the computer work, but uh, today I'm most in the in the silico in silico experiments that in the in the bench. Although I I was like my ideal thing is mixing both things because um, I w wouldn't like to be fully uh, my informatician all the time because I like the idea of, of mixing both things. So moving forward, uh, what is or was your day-to-day -day life as a PhD student? What would you do on a daily basis? Um, for me, at least, I'm working remotely most of the time because, you know, the, the current situation is amazing for working remotely. So, um, yeah, that's basically it, um, you know, trying to, um, to, to, um, to maintain a s schedule, like <laughs> in a daily basis, it's important to, um, to set up a routine, to follow that routine, even though it's not always possible. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult because, you know, each day it's a whole new world. Each day you wake up thinking something different maybe you're working in in something specific and then a problem comes up and then you're like okay well uh, we need to have patience we need to solve this thing 
<laughs> so the struggle of being at home is basically the unavailability to ask other people. I mean, you can ask them, but it's not the same thing as, uh, you know, asking in person. So I would say that's the main limitation for me, like, um, you know, um, communicating with other people. It's a little bit harder for me when, when I stay at home. Um, and when I get to, to go to the lab, I mean, when I get to go to the lab, um, there's not always all of us there um, because, you know, the same thing. So um, I get to talk to people more now, <laughs> like asking them questions about basically anything. I was um, very unlikely to to ask about basically anything. I was um, like more introverted, maybe. And now I'm trying to, you know, talk to people more. So I don't know why I'm talking about this, but <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is that now it's more difficult, but you know, it's possible to keep um, a routine to, uh, you know, uh, get to work and to, you know, um, I, I don't know how to tell you, but it's like adapting. Yeah, that's basically the, the you know, slogan or, um, the main phrase when you when you think of, of uh, bioinformaticians like to adapt and to not to overcome, just like all of you said before. Um, Alba, what is your day to day activities? What are uh, again as Eva say, adapting all the day, <laughs> every day. <laughs> so for me, it's quite chaotic. Maybe every day is different. So I try to have a routine, but I couldn't. Uh, and at, in the end, I, I like this thing of having a creative work in which you are changing and you are evolving every day. And also, uh, in, in my personal situation in the lab, we are very collaborative. I'm the only bioinformatician, so I help in many projects. So I have to, OK, we are going to do this experiment. I have to analyze that. It's new. Uh, the common thing is that the process to analyze data is more or less the same thing. You, you learn, you try several tools, uh, you choose the best one, you explore the data, you plot things. This is common, but at the end, the, the particular issues are changing every day. So, <laughs> um, Miguel? Well, I would like to add uh, uh, on the routine comment because it's really important to have things but also to limit the routine because uh, I have a really big problem balancing my life work uh, area because when you are doing PhD, especially if you are in a broad project or there is not a uh, uh, goal, you uh, can go first. There is always more to do. You can work always more, you can learn something else new. And what is really frustrating is that you are like, exploring new tools, exploring new ways of doing things, exploring new things that you can do. And when you start writing up the results, you discover that the experiments and the analysis that you did at the beginning can be done better with the things that you know a few weeks later or a few months later. So you try to redo everything again. And for me, that was a, like a busy cycle. Where I did something, I don't like it because I discovered something new, and I don't do it. So you have to uh, have a routine and also a, a, like a work path. I'm going to do this in this way, and that's going to be the result. And I'm going to move to the next task. And those are the tasks I have to do. I'm not going to start a secondary or uh, optional uh, missions or optional objectives because it's a never-ending place. If you start doing something else every single time or you don't analyze the results, you don't you feel that you don't have answer. Yes, I think um, time and project management is a key feature to have as a bioinformatician because usually we work with different projects simultaneously and we have to learn to prioritize and organize our time accordingly. And yes, the problem also is that in bioinformatics it's easy to try things and maybe we just uh, lose track of time just trying things and not moving forward to our uh, a goal. So yes, that was a very, in, there were very interesting contributions there. So moving forward, we uh, now are entering a section of uh, questions about the future of bioinformatics. 
And the first question is, if, did you think uh, bioinformatics would reach the point where it is now? Um, I don't think I understood the, the question correctly. I mean, can yeah, you maybe this, this is not a question. It's not very suitable for young bioinformaticians because we uh, maybe we started learning bioinformatics in, in, and the, the, sub, the area hasn't changed that much. But if, mm, the question is, if, did you think that uh, bioinformatics would reach the point where it's, for example, the alpha fold um, thing, mm -hmm. it surprised me. I, I didn't think that I would uh, see this uh, prediction of protein structure so soon. Mm -hmm. so what do you think? Well, Miguel, I, I guess you have more to say than me. <laughs> but I was going to answer this referring to some old professors from when I was still at university. Uh, first time I talk uh, to them about, uh, about informatics and try to get some career advice and discover what the field of informatics was. Most of them hadn't heard about informatics, from mathematics, so it was a sort of drug idea. And uh, they thought it was just going to be a, a specialty inside of the data analysis, uh, like data analysis. Luckily for us, it wasn't only that. Uh, people from other fields or specialists in just one field didn't see, or didn't want to see how the uh, multidisciplinary uh, sciences and uh, fields were going to explode with the new, uh, the new century. And I hope this is going to keep on increasing because as the computational power and the artificial intelligence and neural networks keeps improving, uh, things like the alpha fold are going to be just a toy in a few years. I think that we can improve that model. I don't know how, but I know we can. And we can predict as, as the methods improve and the data for training improves for the intelligence, we are going to be able to do things with the computers that we could not even have. Um, following this line, uh, what do you think that um, technology and bi bioinformatics will provide us in, say, 10 years? Well, what do you think um, it, will, it will be possible in 10 years? Be creative. I hope, I hope um, for personalized medicine to be more developed because I think well, at least for me, it's the easiest thing I can think about uh, in terms of um, something to be a hope and to be um, useful in the future. It's the thing that I I am all all the time working with. So yeah, I hope personalized medicine is better in the future and more you know precise and to be able to to get to a, a precise diagnosis. That that is you know, the, the, the main thing that comes to mind. Another application in the person medicine is not the patient, but the chemicals, the drugs. So I hope that in a few years, we will see that in the medical trials, as right now, they are, the, the population of uh, interest is stratified in gender, age, and medical conditions, they will also be certified by genomic profile in some way. So we could uh, identify or understand better how the drugs work, why the secondary effects happen, and how to prevent them and which drug affects better expression based on the genetic profile, which would be cheaper than just sequencing every patient that arrives to the hospital. Just having an array run on them, match the genetic profile, and go with the best uh, treatment for them based on that information. And uh, also to comment in the case of uh, algorithms and maths itself, uh, I think uh, cool things are have to come. Um, a, a good example of this is, for example, the case of uh, Bayesian statistics. It was something very difficult to implement uh, in the past uh, time. And now we can run this kind of models in our laptops. So. This is something that is always and also evolving and, 
and I expect having new algorithms implemented and new methods to apply to our data uh, while we are having more computational power. And in order to achieve that goal of personalized medicine, do you think what is more important to have more bioinformaticians developing algorithms and or more and or better wet lab techniques to develop more data or better data? What do you think is a path towards uh, personalized medicine? What do we need to implement that? That's a tricky question. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, you can go, you can go, sorry. Thanks. Yeah, no, uh, as I said before, I think that bioinformatics now is driven by the data quality and quantity we have. So those two uh, fields are going to evolve in a symbiotic uh, way. As we have better quality data, we will be able to have better methods. But what I think is critical for the development of personalized medicine is the development of uh, standards, so standard, uh, standardized methods of analysis. Because right now, the transnational bioinformatics, we are just experimenting. We are using uh, tools and algorithms that are still in development, but every day we can something else and we add it. And they are also in the, only in the experimental phase. We need to uh, not, uh, standardize it in some way, maybe uh, not having bioinformatics researchers only in hospitals, but they will be more like a technician level or informatic uh, technicians that will just apply the methods as, as we have uh, other experts in hospitals to apply different tests or interpret the results. Yeah, well, I was going to add uh, to what Miguel said um, that I completely agree. Um, mostly because I, I have been working for a while now with, you know, um, um, tool validation and so um, I also think that um, you know and, and the validation uh, of each tool that comes uh, you know that is developed uh, it must be done just because um, once you get a standardized protocol and everyone uh, you know treats the data the same way uh, you get to be you get to acknowledge the fact that um, you already know the limitations uh, you already know um, what what the technique is lacking. Uh, you know, um, well, not not specifically. You don't know specifically what's missing, but you kind of know the you know the general characteristics of the data that you're missing. So I think that it's important for the future. You know, I think that it's important for you know um, entrepreneurs, uh, people um, who think more broadly to you know develop new techniques uh, to kind of complementary that part that it's uh, not being captured right now i think that would be um very useful but you know i think we are um just waiting for new techniques to to be developed to get to catch more data to get to uh, know better our data even though uh, we generate this data with uh, you know um, a few limitations but i think we're doing our best honestly for, for what we have for now and i hope to you know to keep improving in the future yes um uh, miguel mentioned uh standardization standards um do you think that uh, bioinformatics can reach a point uh, of a standardization where there would be a software backbone that reduce the demand for bioinformaticians? I don't think, honestly. <laughs> I hope we we'll achieve that point at some point in the future. Because if we want to apply or apply informatics to clinical diagnosis, we need to have a standard and we all have to develop a method, every single one of us that wants to do the same analysis. So maybe not a commercial solution, but the community at some point has to agree on some pipeline with some versions of the software that can be reproducible and reproducible by any hospital or technician to achieve the same results and that can be tested so that those results are, are accurate and, and sensitive. I don't remember the, the code. 
de requerimientos de cercanía. Gracias. Ya son estancias las que tú fulfill, tú vieras hoy tu virus en la clase de medicina, en la clase de informática. Yeah, well, I think that is the the optimal situation. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm like more pessimistic a little about that because I think uh, you know it's very very difficult to um, to get everyone to agree on the same you know pipeline or the same workflow because each one of us has different you know um, priorities when it comes to uh, managing data and you know applying filters and so on. So I think that is difficult. Of course, that is the optimal situation, but I don't think that's realistic, at least in the in the in a short period of time. I think it would be it would take longer. And it would take longer to to reach to that point. Alba, are you going to say anything? I say that I find it uh, complex also because uh, I think that uh, pipelines evolve with protocols and protocols are changing all the time. Um, those chains in regarding the hands that you used to do it sometimes and yeah i find i find it quite complex and also because the techniques that we are employing right now are not the same techniques that we employed two years ago so i find it complex maybe the basis of the things uh, should be standardized uh some methods some statistics behind but the product the pipeline itself i find it quite complex And the it's last complex. question. Oh, sorry. No, it's complex, but I'm talking the future, and we have to think that the cases that we see in relational bioinformatics are usually outliers, are really difficult uh, cases to uh, either to classify or to diagnose, and that's why we are working with them on research, because right, right now what we are doing is research. It's not clinical diagnosis. So if we want the informatics to the to clinical step, we need some kind of, uh, we need to improve the methods to decide on some basic methods for pipelines that are going to be able to be used to 99% of the population. And of course, there will always be some cases that you know, that needs some uh, extra research because either they are unique, they are very rare, or they haven't seen it. Okay, so the last question before the questions uh, from the chat is what advice would you give to someone who is uh, dedicating or is thinking to dedicate uh, their life to research, to bioinformatics research? Uh, simple and direct advice. From Keep it up. <laughs> Don't frustrate yourself. You're doing good. You're doing the best you can. Just keep it up. Uh, I would say to find your motivation and pursue that motivation. Find the, mm, the thing that mm, makes you be a good research. Yeah, um, keep going, keep learning. Because every, every single day, there is something in the informatics in every field. It's on every day, and we always keep improving and learning things. And maybe the next year, the next Sense in the pipeline of the next sense in your field is because something different. Okay, so thank you for all your insightful advices. And now we come to some very important questions that it your questions and the questions from the public here. And my colleague Ivan Elson, I don't know if he's around here. Yes, <laughs> here he is. Uh, yeah. My colleague from uh, the RSG Granada Note, Ivan. Uh, will be in charge of this section, so feel free to send in your question for our guests in the chat, well, in the Q&A section. Okay, hi, I'm Ivan. I will be reading your questions. So the first one from Javier Lanillos Manchon, he says, if it helped, would you require in your current job or future interviews to work from home? So... Uh, if anyone, any, anybody wants to answer, I don't know, uh, Eva or Miguel. <laughs> Miguel. I, I was going to say, uh, I work in a public institution, so the conditions of the contracts are not negotiable. It's what, it's what the administration says that you have to do. 
right away and have a uh, remote work abroad. But also on <clears throat> joining a private institution, this depends a lot on your uh, group manager, your group leader. And unlucky, uh, how's the sentence? Science advanced from Pune at the time. That applies also to, to remote work. And there are still some group leaders that need people sitting on their chairs to make sure that they are working. I don't know why it's insightful. We can probably more the other So this in Spain, I think it's really difficult to to make uh, in the practical uh, was, uh, something that you can ask for an interview to interview. Yeah, sure, sure answer to that. Um, yeah, I would um, appreciate if it was an option. But I don't think I would be working from home like you know uh, always. I would I would just go to the lab. If it was an option to work from home, I wouldn't stay at home like always because it, it wouldn't be possible to you know to keep developing um, a research or anything like that. I don't think that's that's a static possibility. I think that it it has it has to be a mix of both. Oh, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, for me too. I find uh, an advantage working at home, but the environment in the lab is more rich and uh, I think that a combination of both will be cool. Yeah. Okay, right. So uh, next question. Uh, Ivan Martin Martin says, uh, which would be a good strategy to look for a good mentor in Spain or abroad? Thanks. I think there is a answer in the in the chat with a good paper called 10 simple rules for choosing a PhD supervisor from Mario Rodriguez Mestre so it, it will be interesting to read but what are your thoughts your thoughts about it anyone and well I, I just stand for uh, for what I said before like you know um, keep in mind that you have to look for for some info when you're, uh, you know, looking for a research group or so on. And I think that paper is good. You should check that out definitely. Um, you know, and yeah, Google Google is always your best friend. So so please um, reach out for you know for people that might know what's going on in a research group or contact people. Don't hesitate to contact people because we are all kind of introverted, but uh, at the same time we're grateful that someone reaches out to us. Yes, that's why we are here too. So, Miguel or Alba? Yeah, I will And especially, I would recommend to contact previous students or current students of the faculty because they can tell you how the work environment is and how they are as members. If they are involved with you or if they are just there for the day. Yeah, also agree. Contact people uh, is, I think, the more revealing thing via Twitter, via whatever. Uh, nowadays, it's easier to do, so we can use those resources. Right. I think it's a web, there's a web called labvisor.net. I will leave it in the chat uh, where people leave their opinions about uh, research groups. I don't know how much information will be there, but maybe it can be interesting for some research groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next question from Luis Revilla. How do you see the national health system on the bioinformatics side? Uh, how do you think they can improve and be better allies to make discoveries and diagnose better, reduce costs, etc.? Um, honestly, um, there's something that I uh, recently, um, you know, uh, someone recently told me about that and I was like shocked, is that there's um, a big gap between, uh, you know, research and software development and pipeline validation or, work or workflow validation and uh, actually applying that in the clinical field. And I didn't know that existed, um, but honestly, it makes sense because uh, it's one thing that you're, you know, trying uh, a software 
Another thing is to get really reliable results from that software to actually write down in a clinical report that is uh, sensitive data that is affecting someone's life and that is very tough to you know to um extrapolate that extrapolate that uh, from the research field to the clinical field and that is very interesting and that's also um you know it's messing with a human side because uh, when you empathize with uh, someone who is being diagnosed you know that it's that it's difficult that it's not easy and you want to have you know reliable data you know what's happening with you what's going on and you need answers and as uh, scientific people <laughs> you know as uh, researchers it's difficult for us to give people uh, specific detailed data about what's going on because we are not sure what's going on we have some idea but we're not always completely sure of what's happening so i think that gap it's it's very um you know challenging uh, at least in the bioinformatics slash uh, clinical side also there are two factors that i think uh keeps away the bioinformatics from the public health system one of them is the, the administration itself that is really slow changing and the second one is medical doctors and other clinicians that doesn't want other specialties going into the field. Right now, what we have seen with the pandemic, I think is that uh, bioinformatics can help the public health system a lot, but not in, in the most popular bioinformatic way, not analyzing uh, genomic sequences or diagnosing people, but improving the clinical workflows of the doctors. Uh, in software that, for example, with the uh, electric, uh, electric uh, digital based history that can extract data from those text fields and uh, run meta analysis on them to detect, for example, new clusters of a new uh, infectious disease that is rising in the area, similar symptoms between patients across the uh, different, uh, different hospitals, or, uh, for example, we've got a really interesting case here in the Carlos III automatizing the laboratory. You can use the informatics to program robots or to uh, automatize as many tasks as possible to uh, get better results with less people, which allows to really easily uh, escalate the, the clinical pathways and the clinical methods for cases of emergency when there is a pandemic or a clinical medicine. So, Alba, any thoughts about it, or do you agree? I uh, I agree with them, but I'm not uh, as I don't have that experience in the as they have in this yeah. in this regard. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, question Adrian is answering is question. It is easier to set the infrastructure for pe personalized biomedicine or to find uh, the agreement on how to handle the whole process of personalized medicine. Uh, sorry, is anyone going to say anything? I was I was just going to say that both are difficult. <laughs> I don't know honestly <laughs> what to say. I mean, what else to say? Um, they're both like quite challenging. I don't know if anyone has anything else to say about this. I don't know which one is easier. That depends on the team of people yeah. you have, the practices, um, the backgrounds. But if you have to start any of them from the beginning by yourself, uh, that's a good challenge. I don't know. It depends. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody wants to say anything else? No? Okay. So, next question. The last one from the chat. 
Uh, how do you manage to keep up with advances in bioinformatics without getting overwhelmed? And uh, which is uh, your strategy? For example, resources, uh, journals, social media, etc. Does it count that you're always struggling? <laughs> that, is, that, <laughs> is that a strategy? <laughs> because I don't think that it is. <laughs> um, honestly, I don't know what to say say because it I mean you're trying your best to to not get overwhelmed by all of it but I think sometimes I just you know I try to control myself like I need to do this step by step otherwise if I get overwhelmed I won't get anything done and that is a very very hard time for me because when I'm not productive I feel like I'm not being useful so that, that's tough for me that's that's very tough Miguel I think at some point you start, you stop feeling overwhelmed and you start feeling uh, excited about everything that happens. At least that's what happens with me because uh, it doesn't matter how many sources you take, how many people you follow, uh, there is always something new that happens somewhere else out of your radar. And after you have the uh, choose a tool or you have a benchmark, all of them, a few weeks later or out of the blue, someone tells you, hey, this is a new method. It uh, improves the results of everything else. Now you have to check it again. At some point, I just feel excited. I excited how they did it, how they managed to do it. Um, keep going forward. It's, it's something similar as what I said during the IPSD. You have to have a routine not only in your day to day life, but also in your work life. You have to decide, I'm going to do this, I have decided this, I have this time for the same which we are going to use. Unless there is some graphic changes, I have to pick it up because it's not uh, kind of producing the results. That's a good strategy. Yeah. It's quite complex because at the beginning, uh, I had like all the possible alerts in my mail uh, regarding uh, by by informatic journals and things like that. Then um, Twitter is all the time with the new publications and, and things like that. But uh, yeah, it's overwhelming. You have to find the balance somehow. Okay, so that's uh, that was the last question from the chat. So Marisol, can okay. we... thank you, Ivan. So it was a very very interesting roundtable. As always, uh, with people with such an interesting background here, it there's not enough time. So I encourage you to participate in the last activity of the day. Is the social gathering in our meet tables to continue getting to know your fellow bioinformaticians and discussing about, I don't know, hating programming in R or hating or loving BIM <laughs> or about mental health issues that uh, during the PhD that I think that's uh, a very interesting topic to discuss about. So, well, but before that activity, uh, I hand over to Adrián, who will introduce the next speaker, which is from RSD Argentina. Adrián? Are you over there? Well, I think, yes, he's here, so. I think we end this session and start mm -hmm. a new one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I think we, we had it programmed for, uh, for in 10 minutes. We have a 10 minutes break and then we start. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eva, Alba, Miguel, and myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming us here and for this nice session. You know, in the meantime,